I was the closing speaker uh, for President Clinton at CGI, and at the end of his introduction, he said to me, Peter, why are you so positive about the future? Don't you watch the news? And I said, President Clinton, with all due respect, no, I don't watch the news. <laughs> and I look at the data. And so the reality is that as we humans were evolving on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, back then, if we missed a piece of negative news, like so rustling of the leaves is the wind and not a lion, you know, the negative news could put you out of your misery. And we developed an ancient piece for our temporal lobe called the amygdala, about the size of your thumb, that scans everything you see and everything you hear for negative news. And if you see it, it puts you on red alert. And it's not something we control, it's something deep wired into our brains. And at the end of the day, the news media uses this, right? The old adage, if it bleeds, it leads, is so true, right? If you ask yourself the question, you know, what's the news media's job? It's to deliver your eyeballs to their advertisers. That's it, pure and simple. And so if we're paying 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news, open up the newspaper tomorrow morning and just count the number of negative stories to positive stories. It's extraordinary, it's 10 to one. I mean, do the experiment. And it's not that they're you know, masochistic or that they wanna just you know, have a negative mindset. It's their business. They don't show you all the other amazing news going on in the world every single day. And so I choose not to watch the news. I mean, period, I get back two hours a day, it's amazing. My social network will tell me what I need to know, my family will, my friends will. There's nothing I don't miss. I have Google alerts for my companies and the things that I care about, but allowing you know, the crisis news network or Fox or whomever it might be to tell me what they think I should be learning, uh-uh, not what I wanna do with my time. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Peter Diamandis and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, put yourself out there. I'm at MIT, I'm, uh, it's my sophomore year, and I'm passionate about space. I find out there's no student space organization at MIT. Oh my God, it's, you're crazy. It's MIT, it's a student space organization. And so I go to the MIT uh, Student Center and I find out you need to get uh, five signatures to start a group. And I, I'm the first, I get three of my fraternity brothers, uh, uh, Bill, Brad, and Roland as the third, and then one of their girlfriends, Natalie. And that's our first five. And we get it, we submit it, and I'm here, I'm running the Student Space Organization. And I go and I poster MIT, this is before the days of the internet, right? Before computers, I, like, sket, like, like rub on letter type of days, like you Whoa. know, in photo, photocopy days, this is 1982, thereabouts. And I, I, I poster the entire campus, and 30 people show up at this meeting where I pitched this idea of creating a student space organization. And after that meeting, I was so enthralled by this level of energy, like, oh my God, this has a future. Right. And I remember standing outside the student center, looking up at the stars, and sort of seeing, fast forward, this organization actually becoming what it's become. And I sent out letters along with two of my colleagues, and it gets published by Astronomy, Analog, and Omni Magazine, and hundreds of people write letters back in and the organization blossoms into an international student space organization. I find myself running in the living room of my fraternity, right? Now, uh, it was a success and I became addicted to that feeling of success. Mm. Now, had that been a failure, had I done that and next year no one showed up and it flopped, maybe we'd be having a different story. Right. But in the success, I was like, okay, what can I do next? And next for me uh, was something called the Space Generation Foundation and then International Space University, ISU, which is you know, an, another major nonprofit success but has grown into a $100 million university you know, around the world and it's just been amazing. But I think part of this is putting yourself out there and trying. It's the ratio of zero to, zero to one is infinite. Mm. And how do you get people to just try to overcome their fears? That's the hard part. And it's the realization that it's okay to fail. 
but it's even better to succeed. Rule number three, dream big. We're living in a time right now where you can have a big idea and you can test and iterate, test and iterate, test and iterate very rapidly until you find the right product market fit. Um, and things can scale. You know, we're going from I've got an idea to I run a billion dollar company fashion anytime in human history. There are more unicorns than ever before because there's more capital than ever before. And entrepreneurs can come up with an idea and test it Quickly. Quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and fail it quickly or iterate different versions of it quickly. And that's an amazing time. Um, and so it's never been better to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and I'm, my, I talk about this uh, in all the work I do when I'm working with people. I say, first and foremost, it's critically important for you to get clarity on your, what I call your massively transformative purpose. What are you on this planet to do? Mm. Uh, doing anything big and bold is hard work. Hard. It's all hard work, all right? Hard. We have this, we get this incredible, you know, um, fantasy of what it was like to be Jeff Bezos or be Elon Musk or be, you know, Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg yeah. all these guys. And the fact of the matter is, we think it's easy. We think it's like start at idea and go straight to billion dollars valuation, but it's not. There are incredibly difficult uh, times along the road, mm -hmm. right? There is this, this period of, of launch your idea and then on the door, on the death of, you know, the, uh, the, the doorstep of death over and over and over again right. and not giving up. I joke that a lot of my most successful ventures are overnight successes after 11 years of hard work, yeah. right? I know Elon well, and looking at what he did with Tesla and with SpaceX is extraordinary. But it was hard. It's still it was, hard. It's still hard. And it was on, you know, he tells the stories of being on the, on the brink of, um, of, you know, bankruptcy, on the brink of running out of capital. And it was his sheer fortitude, right? Uh, the team at Airbnb, I mean, they iterated their idea hundreds of times to get something that works. And so, but it's possible now mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur where before you would, uh, failure was a death knell. Today, it's experience. Rule number four, become an expert. We're living in a world where access to expertise is everywhere. You and every one of us is an expert in something. But at the end of the day, if you want to do something in your life that you don't know how to do, but you're passionate about doing it, you can reach out there and get all the expertise you need. What are you passionate about changing? What do you want to do on this planet? For me, it was space. I wanted to go to space since I was a child. I was born in the tail end, I mean, born in the tail end of, the, of, the, of the Apollo era, and literally it formed my vision of what I wanted to do. I wanted to become an astronaut so badly, right? The Apollo program, hard to believe, was 49 years ago we landed on the moon. The Apollo program showed us what was possible. And then this scientific documentary showed us where we were going. a hopeful vision of the future. And this lit up my life. And I was absolutely clear of what I was doing. I knew my massively transformative purpose. It was to help take the human race off the planet to the stars. And after I looked at the numbers, I found out my chance of becoming an astronaut were like one in a thousand. I had a better chance of becoming an NBA all-star at 5'5 five five than I did entering the astronaut car. <laughs> And then one day I read about Lindbergh that in 1927, he crossed the Atlantic not on a whim, but to win a $25,000 prize. And so when I gave up on NASA being the way I was gonna go to space, I said, how am I gonna get a spaceship to go to space? I figured out this is what I'm gonna do, right? I was gonna create a $10 million prize. 10 million was enough to inspire the entrepreneurs, but not the Boeings and the Lockheeds. And I was gonna offer it up for the team who could build a private spaceship, carry three adults, me and a friend and a pilot, or you know, an autopilot and three of us, up to 100 kilometers, land safely, and do it again within two weeks. Amazingly, that $10 million prize ended up inspiring 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million trying to solve it. They're all optimists. This was the winning moment in Mojave on October 4th, of 2014, 
Here's the vehicle, Spaceship One, hanging in the Smithsonian right next to the Spirit of St. Louis that inspired in the first place. And so for me, my challenge that I wanted to do was I wanted to find the experts out there in the world that could build me the private spaceships that would take me and my friends to space. And this idea of an incentive prize, it worked. It worked amazingly well. We didn't pay any of the losers. We only paid the winner. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, find your purpose. A great question. If you have a lot of passionate people, can you go and solve any problem? And the question is, is there a lack of leadership? And absolutely, when I talk about passion, I'm not talking about passion on its own that's undirected. I'm talking about the individual who says, I am sick and tired of this problem. And I am going to dedicate my life to solving that problem. That's true passion. And I, you know, I, I think a lot about the incredible wealth we have today more than ever before. And so for folks like Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, who I've had a chance to have this conversation with, and we talk about the giving pledge, right? Like I'm gonna give half of my wealth away before I die into a foundation. And I call bullshit on this. What I really want are individuals of means. And means comes with reputation, means comes with capital, means comes with corporate resources, means comes with you know, all kinds of different versions of means. It's an individual saying, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of having women uneducated in Mumbai or Tanzania. I'm tired about these issues around, you know, unequal rights or these people being oppressed or people not having water or food. And I'm calling my shot. I'm going to solve that problem. That's passion for me. And leadership, you're absolutely right. Perhaps I should use the word leadership as well. But the most passionate individual says, I don't know how, but I am going to solve that problem. I'm dedicating my life and I'm announcing to the world right here, right now, this is my purpose. And I'm going to use my capital, my, my resources, the best of technology I have in hand, to solve that problem. And what I teach here at Singular University is that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities, right? Aren't they? If you think about the notion of what are the biggest problems on the planet? Food, energy, water, you know, healthcare, education, communications, housing. For hundreds of millions and billions of people, and they are also the world's biggest opportunities. And so when I'm out there preaching to, my, to the people who work with me at my Abundance 360, that work with me at SU and my venture fund is, listen, the name of the game should not just be wealth creation. That's great, but wealth in the service of what? What are you gonna do with it? You know, after you've left $50 million to your kids, which could ruin them, you know, what are you gonna do with your money? What is the difference you want to make? What is the big problem that you care about so passionately about you're going to lead? And so thank you. I'm going to start to use the word leadership and passion in what I say. But is that a, a, fair, a fair point? Rule number six, stop complaining. We're living in a world that is fear-driven to a large extent, right? Um, and there's a reason for this. As we were evolving millions of years ago, there were so many things that could kill us. And our brains evolved a part of the brain called the amygdala that looks and listens for all the dangers in your world. And this was evolutionarily beneficial, you know, centuries and millennia ago uh, when we were under constant threat. And when you hear something negative, it puts you on red alert and you pay immediate attention, right? So you see like a rustle in the leaves and you think a, you think a tiger rather than the wind. You see a you know, crack on the ground, you think snake rather than a stick. Because you and have to think the worst case scenario to save your life. To save your life. It would save your life before. Now, 
what happens is our news media bombards us with negative news all the time, right? I, I laughingly call CNN the crisis news network or the right. constantly negative news network. I don't have a good, <laughs> I don't have a good version for Fox, but uh, but it it is we're living in a world where listen, there 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 are media companies whose mission it is to deliver your eyeballs to their advertisers, and if we pay ten times more attention to negative news and positive news. That's what we're feeding. So I, you know, I when I'm, uh, you know, I coach 360 CEOs every year at my abundance event right here in Beverly Hills mm-hmm. and 5,000 entrepreneurs. And I'm saying, listen, at the end of the day, you know, run the experiment, pick up the newspaper tomorrow, and count the number of positive stories to negative stories. Right? It's it's like maybe, ten to one negative maybe to positive. One out of a, yeah. And and it's not that it's not true. I'm not saying it's you know fake news. What I'm saying is that there's so much amazingly positive news, you just don't hear about it because good news networks don't succeed. <laughs> and so we're bombarded, by, we're bombarded by this negative news and it changes our mindset yeah. and it puts us in a state of fear. And uh, fear is not a good place from which to live your life or make the world a better place. Can you be creative from a place of fear and no, terror? No, you're, 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 you're restrictive. You're, you're, uh, you're uh, scarcity minded. You're not creative and expansive and you're looking to protect what you have versus uh-huh. create something new. And so a lot of my work at the XPRIZE, in Abundance 360, at Singular University, in my books are around helping people see the world a different way, right? We're living arguably during one of the most extraordinary times in human history. Uh, today, an individual is more powerful than, than presidents were mm-hmm. a few decades back, Crazy, more than the it? kings and the queens. We have access to more knowledge, energy, capital, computational power. People don't honestly know how powerful they are to, to make their dreams come to you, to transform the world, to find a problem and solve a problem. Right? So I'm, I'm with the entrepreneurs that I support. I say, listen, stop complaining and start solving. Go, go find a solution. Go find a solution, because the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. That's true. Right, and I teach this throughout my programs. Want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. Right, this beautiful convergence uh, that, that we're so powerful and we can solve these problems. Not everything, but I think a good number of them. Rule number seven, think like a problem solver. I have a belief that every problem is solvable. It may not be easy. How did you come up with that? Because that, for most people, would seem pretty counterintuitive. Well, uh, because as I think about the world we're living in today, it's the realization that we have solved so many problems to achieve this extraordinary world we live in today in terms of global production of food, of energy, of water, of information. We're living in in the world of Star Trek. You know, I mean, it's, you think about that, that we can diagnose almost anything, I can read your genome for a hundred bucks in a matter of a couple of hours, and understand all 3.2 billion letters of your life and have an AI analyze that and tell me about yourself, right? I can, I can on one of these devices, call up any piece of information, talk to anyone on the planet. These are, this is magic, this is crazy stuff. You know, just 20 years ago, let alone, you know, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. So, you know, the realization is any problem is only a problem contextually today. And we're going to be creating the tools and knowledge to be able to solve that problem. And I, I believe that any problem not forbidden by the laws of physics is solvable. And even then, we're going to sort of learn where the boundaries of physics truly are. Rule number eight, believe. Doing anything big and bold in the world requires an emotional energy source, right? If you want to do something big and bold, you have to find inside of you what I would call your massively transformative purpose. That thing that wakes you up in the morning and keeps you going at night. And that source of energy is emotion. It's not cognitive, it's emotion. And it comes from one of two places typically. It comes from inspiration, awe, the desire to do something greater than yourself, or it comes from a place of pain, or I am so pissed, so angry, so I refuse to let that go on a day longer. And I think 
Part of my energy came from both of those places. It was very much the inspiration of the stars, the desire, and being pissed off that the chance of becoming an astro astronaut were one in a thousand. And then there's the field of fascination and love and creation and just the, if you can, why don't you? And if we can, why don't we? Uh, and so I get excited about what are the world's biggest problems that we can solve. I'm working you know, with an amazing man, Tony Robbins, who's become a dear friend. And it's like, what's an X prize to feed the next billion people? Right? And so I'm just literally off of conversations in the last hour about what that would be and how we're going to do it. That just that turns me on. That gets me excited. And by the way, it's something that is available to everybody. Right? As soon as you start scaling up what you believe you can do, and the challenges you want to take on, and the belief that you can, or with your fellow SU alums, or friends, or family, that we can play a bigger game than ever before, the first step is belief. Because if you believe you can, or believe you can't, you're right. Rule number nine, prioritize your health. I think there's nothing that's more valuable to uh, all of us and our families than uh, healthy years. And uh, let's define longevity in the first place. You know, the average age of hominids back 100,000 years ago was probably in their late 20s, right? And then it expanded during the, you know, Middle Ages into the early 30s. And then 100 years ago, it was in your 40s. Today, it's, you know, in their late 70s. Um, and I like to think about the fact that uh, I don't believe humans were, on the whole, designed to live past age 30. Uh, we would have a baby by age 13 before there was birth control. <laughs> I mean, seriously, before, you know, you'd go yeah, in puberty and you have a baby. And by the time you were, you know, 27 or 28, your baby was having a baby. And before McDonald's and Whole Foods, before food was abundant, uh, the worst thing you wanted to do to perpetuate the species was take food out of your grandchildren's mouths. Yes. And so, uh, so that was very much reality for it's the, what we evolved during. And, and then all the diseases of older age, cancer, heart disease, dementia, um, even when, when uh, aneurysms take people, the wear and tear of the body, all of those diseases were never selected against if you didn't get it past age 30. So no. we're in optimal health in our 20s and 30s. And then, and then we start the ravages of old age. And what's interesting, and I think you know this as much or more than I, that the conversation around longevity, and I'm going to define it more as age reversal, like mm. uh, how do we slow aging, stop aging, even reverse aging, which would have been a really um, crazy conversation to have had even five years ago, is now become the conversation du jour in the medical community and in the venture community. And there's more people thinking about and working on it. Uh, and, and so I think, I personally believe, and I hopefully at the end of this conversation, uh, You'll, you'll believe, or others will, that we're about to go into a renaissance of, uh, of health. We're about to massively disrupt the health industry, reinvent it. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is fix your mindset. How you think controls everything. How successful you'll be or not. Who you spend time with or don't. It's everything. So while I can stand on stage here and lecture about exponential technologies like I do up at Singularity University or solving the world's grand challenges at the X Prize for a week you know, solid, that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about your mindset because it's everything, everything. So let me start. The first is I want to tell you without any question, and I hope you get this and believe it, we're living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. The only time more exciting than today is tomorrow, and so on, and so on. And we forget how brutal the world used to be. A hundred years ago, in the year 1918, 250 million people were infected by the Spanish flu. 50 million people died in that one year. 
20 million people died in World War I. Scale that up by a factor of four proportional to today's population, it would be insane to see headlines like that. But ultimately, the world is amazing. The other thing that's true is that none of us truly have any idea how fast the world is changing. We're changing at an accelerating rate. And for me, that means that the tools we're going to have to change the world are getting more and more powerful at a speed that is going to shock us. Everyone knows about someone who went to the hospital and, oh my God, you've got stage three or stage four cancer. It didn't happen that morning, yeah. right? If you detect cancer at stage three or stage four, your chance of a cure is like 10%. If you detect it at stage zero or stage one, it's like 99%, wow. right? So it's not, it varies for different cancers, but the idea is we're all developing cancers. Your immune system hopefully catches it, but otherwise we give people a grail test as well. So for me, fountain life is like one of the most important uh, reinventing how we, do, how we do healthcare. And one of the things we just launched, which I'm so proud of is fountain health. And it's a, so I wrote in my last book, um, The Future is Faster Than You Think, that the insurance industry is perverted. When you, get, when you get fire insurance, it pays you after your house burns down. Life insurance pays you after, or pays your next kin after you're dead. Health insurance pays you after you're sick. So we created Fountain Health as a health insurance. It's available for companies right now, 50 employees or more, and then it'll, it'll grow from there. But when you get found health insurance, which is the same price as regular health insurance, you get all the tests included at no additional cost. Mm -hmm. Because our goal is to, uh, to catch any disease first before uh, it becomes something that's expensive to treat right. later on. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Tony Robbins, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. People think they have to know how. I call it the tyranny of how. Like you get all excited, I'm gonna do this. And then your brain goes, I've never done it before. Oh my God, what did I say? I, I don't know how to do this.